right. For all the fathers that are here this, today, we have a present from the church over here. There's a, a cup, a little coffee mug cup, and some little instant coffee and thing in it. So please go af afterwards, pick one out, and choose whichever one you want, and uh, that's your present from the church. So please help yourself for that after the, after the service. So uh, the Bible says to honor thy father and thy mother. So we take one, one day a year to honor fathers and honor mothers. Um, and so we're going to look today about... Uh, about what the Bible says about fathers. Um, God says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And so that's a lofty goal, to be perfect like God is perfect. Um, but that's the goal we should strive for, and eventually we will be uh, sanctified holy. We will be not able to sin. Right now we're able not to sin, but one day we will be not able to sin, which would be wonderful, and that is the goal. But it is a struggle down here. But that is the goal. It should always be the goal. Um, to be like Christ should be the goal of our life. And that's what God wills for us. You know, if you ask, uh, what kind of father do you want? Or if you ask, what kind of father do you want to be? Two fathers. The answer should be the same. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you want a certain kind of father, the father, if he's the right father, he should want to be that kind of father. Okay. Uh, so most people's answer would be something like, um, I would like to my father to be a strong father. Or most fathers would say, I would like to be strong for my family. Uh, and so we're going to look at a few verses later, but let's just look at the list, uh, a list of characteristics uh, of fathers that we would deem desirable, that the Bible would also deem desirable. And so fathers should be strong. Why? Uh, the Bible calls, uh, calls us to help and to, to strengthen those who are weaker. Okay? And the Bible says that the wife is the weaker vessel, and so we should give her the help and the honor that she is due as a weaker vessel. And so God has given us the strength that he has not given her. He has given us the strength that he has not given our children so that we will be their strength. God wants us to be strong for them. God wants us to have the strength. Now that's you know talking about physical strength, not primarily, but, you know, uh, you know, what, what does the wife always say? Honey, can you get some here and lift this for me? I can't. It's too heavy. I can't pick it up. And so I have to go fix it up or whatever, you know. Um, and I encourage my wife to do that because she's always trying to do things herself and hurting herself. <laughs> oh, you know, like, why didn't you call me? Well, I'm going to bother you. <laughs> so that's why we're being given these stronger bodies because we're supposed to be doing the heavy stuff. So strength is not, but, you know, physical strength, yes. Uh, we, are, we have been given the strength to do what God has given us the job to do. He's given us a job to do. He's given us the strength to match that job. And so our job is to be the strength for our family. Uh, physical strength, sure. Uh, but mental strength, you know, we are the one that should be helping and supporting, you know, most you know, general in, in personalities. Most uh, women need the emotional s support of their husband. And the husband should have the strength to be that emotional support, that, that uh, not only physical support, but the emotional support. Uh, most husbands, a lot of husbands don't want to be that emotional support, but God has given them a stability and a strength in general that he's not given some women sometimes. He's made women suited for their role and that they have, they are the way they are, not because they're defective, okay? We're all defective, but they are the way they are because God designed them for a particular role um, of mothering and things. And they have to be the way they are to be able to fulfill their purpose in God's purpose for their life. But men have been given the strength to do what they need to do in support of their family. Uh, to, so be the, the emotional strength. you know. And, and of course, many people are different, have different personalities and things like that. But in general, God has given us the role of support, of helping to be the strength for our children to be the emotional stability in the home, to have the strength. You know, things that bother my wife don't bother you know, me. You know, when, when our, our first dog died, you know, my wife was emotional about it, and you know, I had to help, and I'm the one that had to dig the hole to bury it. You know? <laughs> she was crying. You know? <laughs> I need to be a support and the strength to help, and, and uh, she is more compassionate than I am. But, uh, so not, it's, it's physical strength. We have the physical strength because God has given us the role of being the strong uh, support, physical strength, and then also the, the emotional support and strength. 
And then, but that most of all, spiritual. We are to be the spiritual strength in our home. We have, we have, need to get strength to help our family, our, our wife and our children, to have the strength that they are lacking. We need to be their strength, and their support, and their help, and their um, rock, and their strength. Just like God is our strength. Now that strength isn't in us, and we'll look at that little a verse a little bit later that says that. That strength is not in us, it is in God. We are supposed to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Okay? So we get our strength from God. We don't have the strength. We don't have the strength to be the physical strength. We need God's strength. We don't have the emotional strength to be the strength that our wife needs unless we get it from God. And so we need God's strength to be strong for our wives and for our, for our children. So uh, physical strength, emotional strength, and spiritual strength. Okay. So, most uh, people want a father that is a strong father, you know, not a weak father. And not everybody has the same strength physically, but you can be the strongest father you can be. You know, some people are small. I know, um, yeah. I know my, my, young, uh, my oldest son, maybe he won't watch this video. So. <laughs> it's not as tall as my youngest son, and especially when he was younger, I used to kind of bother him. It's only just a little bit, but you know, He's the older one, so he needs to be taller, you know. And so, you know, for pictures and stuff, he would like stand because <laughs> his little brother ain't gonna be taller than me, you know. Kind of. So, um, but we, we can be as strong as we can be. We can be tall as we can be. Try to you know be as strong as you can be and uh, develop your uh, physical strength to be able to you know you just can't say well I'm not strong so it's too bad do it yourself. No, we need to be strong so we can uh, we can be the physical strength, the emotional strength. We need to develop ourselves emotionally. To be strong for our families and also spiritually. You know, even if you're not physically strong, you can be spiritually strong. Okay, uh, Paul was a spiritual giant, but he wasn't a giant of a man. Evidently, he, you know, from the descriptions that he gives in some of his epistles, you get the idea that he wasn't big, brawny, you know, masculine type thing. You know, um, he, he even admitted that his weakness. He was sometimes depressed and was weak and you know things like that. So. But he was a spiritual giant, you know. So we can be, no matter what you are, physical, you can be spiritually strong. We need to be spiritually strong for our families. And so, a strong father. So as fathers, we need to, to determine to be strong. Be the strongest fathers we can be for our family. And then, kindness. We are, uh, you know, most children and most, uh, you know, children want their parents to be, want their fathers to be kind. Okay? To be kind. What is kind? It's considerate of others, thinking about others uh, more than yourself. Now, uh, a lot of these things we'll go through um, have uh, overlapping uh, meaning. You know, the the definition. You know, we'll we'll look at love. Well, love is kind. So you know, love and kindness kind of are together. They're overlapping uh, definitions there. Um, but we need to be kind. We need to be considerate of other people. We need to think about them first, not ourselves. Not be selfish and say, you know. I, I want this, and I want to do that, and it takes you taking my time from doing what I want to have to do what you need to do, you know, and sometimes we can be like that, and sometimes we can let our wives or our children know that they're very inconvenient to us. We want to watch this show, we want to go here, and you, now I have to do this for you, you know, <laughs> that's not kind, and kind is thinking of the others, not yourself, okay, and uh, I know many times we want to retire, we work, and come home, we don't have, want to have to do things, and I'm, everybody's the same way, you know? Saying that, but the Bible says to be kind, and we need to be kind. And so, it is a wonderful thing to have a kind father who is considerate and who thinks about you more than himself. You know, he, you know if you have a need, he's willing to drop what he has to, you know, even come home. Um, I remember one time when um, this is not when I was a father, but uh, uh, just to illustrate um, sometimes the need that others have that puts a demand on you. It's like one time when I was, before, where I was dating my wife, we, uh, she worked at night uh, when they had that, she worked in the you know, costume room, and she would, when they have plays, they would rehearse all night for the plays, and then, they, you know, then they would put them on the next week or whatever. And it was a big, huge, huge, uh, thousands of people came, came to, to see the plays, and so it would have to be up all night, and so when, and I lived, at the time when we were dating, I lived about 40 minutes from school where she was working, and so about 11 o'clock at night, she's called me. I'm, I'm hungry and we, we're, you know, we're stuck here. We can't leave. Could you go get me something? So I go all the way, 40 minutes, and go got a burger and took it over to her and her friend and go goodbye and go 40 minutes all the way back, you know? 
Yeah, but I was happy to do that, you know, back then. Back then. I love making you stupid, you know. <laughs> you know, if I had thought, what is, I'm not going to drive 40 minutes all that way, you know, and I could have said that, and, uh, you know, um, maybe today I would. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. That, that's the kindness. Not thinking of yourself, not thinking, what? I, I'm going to inconvenience me for you? No. I didn't even think about it, you know. Um, now, I don't actually think she asked me this. She just called me and said, I'm hungry. <laughs> and so I brought her and drove 40 minutes and bought her something, you know. So that's kind. Considering about other people more than yourself. Not thinking about you and what you want and what, and that they're an inconvenience to you, you know. They're, you have an opportunity to show the importance to them that, that they are. And then this word is an interesting word, tender-hearted. The, Bible, uh, the New Testament, uh, the King James Version says tender-hearted. The actual Greek word says, um, it used, instead of heart, it, so we think of the center of emotion as the heart, okay? We say, you know, that touched my heart, you know, and so we, we kind of touch our physical hearts, but that's not what, it, you know. But we think the center of our emotions is in our heart, you know. But the Jews had the idea that the center of their emotion was in their guts, <laughs> in their intestines, you know, intestinal fortitude, and then, you know, it's a, so that their word is bowels of, you know, you, you read it in the King James says bowels of mercy, your bowels, you know, you know what your bowels are, you know, when you have a bowel movement, <laughs> your bowels are your, like, intestines, large intestines and things, you know, so that, we don't say, like, oh, I love you so much, with all my intestines, you know, <laughs> But that's what that word literally is. So it's translated, you know, tender hearted, but it means tender bowels, you know, tender large intestines. <laughs> anyway, the idea is that with all your, you know, your heart is tender towards somebody, your emotions are tender towards somebody. And we need to be kind, and we need to be tender hearted to word, especially our younger children. And we can be domineering, you know, we can we're we can be intimidated. Just, you know, I'm always been since I've been a father, I've always been over six foot tall. And since I've been a father, I've usually always been over a couple of hundred pounds, you know, sometimes 300 pounds, but, you know, and so to a little child, that's very intimidating. If you're mad. <laughs> what? You want like, oh. It's not very tender hearted, you know. We should understanding and be considerate to them and tender hearted uh, to them. And then forgiving. Uh, a relationship will not work without forgiveness. And the Bible mentions much about forgiveness. Um, and what a relationship has to have forgiveness. Now, that means, what does it mean to forgive? Um, it means to not hold somebody's wrongdoing against them, okay? Uh, to forget about it. Now, I don't have a long memory. Sometimes I forget things, you know, and John can attest to that. <laughs> I forget, I did, I said that? You know, I don't remember saying that. But then uh, I was, you know, I probably did say it, but I don't remember saying it. I have a short, that helps to forget. You did what? I don't remember you doing that. <laughs> it's not that I forgave, I just forgot. <laughs> no, but, but that's what it means. It means to, you know, to forgive means to, to like, in essence, forget. In essence, don't hold it against them. Uh, it is easier to forgive if you do forget. Now, the Bible says that God doesn't remember our sins anymore. That doesn't mean he forgets. That doesn't mean he doesn't have the ability to remember them anymore. It's not like God is like, oh, I don't remember to you know, <laughs> sin. No, he deliberately, uh, he purposely does not choose to bring those back up into his memory. He chooses to not remember. He remembers our sin no more. He puts them from him, and he doesn't hold them against us anymore. And that's what we need to be to each other. Uh, we cannot have the relationship we need to if we hold things, you know. If we say, oh, you did that before, and that was wrong, and you did me bad, and so I'm going to remember that. And next time, everything you say and see in your, your, your children, your wife, you know, you hold that against them. No, you need to be forgiving. And, you know, the thing is, we love to be forgiven. We, we appreciate when people, you know, you, know you, you appreciate that God forgave your sins, right? You know, if he didn't, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to be in hell, that's all. And so we appreciate, you know, we, we're, we're appreciated when people, you know, if we do something stupid, and we say, oh, I'm sorry, and they go, oh, that's okay, don't worry about it. We go, oh, thank you, you know. But when somebody does it to us, and they say, you know, I'm sorry, and we don't say, oh, well, you know, you know, we need to be forgiving. We need to be as forgiving as we are, uh, as willing to forgive as we are willing to be forgiven. None of us is unwilling to be forgiven, you know. We don't usually hold things against ourselves. Well, it was a mistake. I didn't mean to. We excuse ourselves. So why don't we excuse other people who sin against us? We, we find reason to hold things against them sometimes. And so we need to be forgiving. And so if a father needs to be forgiving, his children are going to make mistakes, and they're going to offend him, they're going to 
do things that they shouldn't do. Um, but we need to be forgiving. We need to be loving. We need to be forgiving. And then the next one is loving. Um, this this word, of course, you, you know, we've talked about many, many times. Love. This word agape is the word that means selfless, not thinking about yourself, only thinking about the other. What would benefit that person, not what would benefit me? And so when we love somebody, we are willing to give of ourselves because we're not thinking about ourselves. We're, we give freely of our time. We give freely of our resources. We give of our strength. We give of our effort. We give of our um, talent for the benefit of others. You know, God loved us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, it, it was agony. It was agony to be on the cross physically. It was agony to be uh, separated from the Father. He was suffering the punishment of God's wrath against him on our behalf. And God had poured out his wrath upon Jesus Christ because it was the wrath that I deserved. But Christ took my punishment and the wrath upon him. But he experienced God's wrath, his Father's loving Father's wrath for me and for you. And so it was not pleasant. It was the most unpleasant thing that you could ever no, and we, we don't even have any idea what, you know, we have an idea maybe of what uh, physical torture is, but we don't have as close a relationship to God as Jesus did to understand the, the sor sorrow of separation between God the Father as God poured out his wrath upon the Son. And so, but he was willing to do that for me and for you. He, he, it cost him a lot. And so when we love as we ought to, it will cost us a lot. It will cost us, you know, financially, uh, strength, you know, emotional strength, every, everything, all the resources that we have, we must put at the disposal of those whom we love. And we need to love. We, so uh, a child wants a loving father, a loving father, probably number one, if you would say loving, but really all these definitions overlap, you know, kindness comes out of loving, you know, tenderheartedness comes out of love, you know, so they all involve love. And so we must be loving parents and consider uh, others more than ourselves. Not just not ourselves, but what they would. And then joyful. Uh, we want to be happy, joyful. Uh, you know, have you ever known a grumpy person? <laughs> you know, it's not pleasant to be, be around, you know. Uh, your children should want to be around you, and they shouldn't want to be afraid. They shouldn't be afraid to be around you. They shouldn't say, oh, no, you know, Daddy, I wonder if he's in a good mood today. You know, bite our heads off, you know. You should be a joyful and happy, and, and uh, joy is an internal thing, not a, not an external thing. Joy is irres irrespective of circumstance. Your joy is a condition of your heart, regardless. And so you can be joyful no matter what the circumstances are. You say, "I can't be happy because look, I just my car blew up and my door fell down and I lost my job and I, whatever else you want to <laughs> stack on that." You know, I can't be happy. You can rejoice. You can rejoice in the fact that God knows and he's in control and he has a plan and something he's going to work out good and you can be excited about that. And so you should be joyful all the time. Okay? Even if the outward circumstances aren't pleasant, we can be joyful. And so we need to be joyful. And then we need to have peace. We need to be peace, peaceful and peacemakers. Uh, peace. Peace, of course, uh, with God, first of all. Our, our peace with everybody else is based upon our peace with God. Uh, when we have peace with God, there's no... No hindrance between us, our, our fellowship, our relationship between God. We have peace with God because we have taken care of our sin, and our sin is covered with, in, by Calvary and with Christ's blood, and we have peace. And so we must be peaceful and love peace and desire and work for peace and strive for peace, be a peacemaker in our family. You know, we, uh, we all often, as fathers, are called upon to be peacemakers, you know, between children or whatever. And so we must be the ones. And sometimes I think we're the ones that cause the conflict. You know, we should be the ones who call it peace. And so uh, peacemakers and peace. And then patient. Uh, patient. We, just, we need to be patient with our children, with our wives, with everybody. We need to be patient people. Now that word patient in the Greek is an interesting. We talked about this yesterday in the men's meeting. But uh, patient in Greek means to remain under. Remain under. That's what the word means. It remain under, under, and then remain together. So we remain under pressure. Okay? We don't get out from under pressure. You know, that's our tendency, isn't it? When something difficult, something hard, something painful comes, we want to just get out from underneath the pain and the pressure and the difficulty. We want to 
run away. Okay? But we don't run away because we know that God has that for a purpose, to strengthen us. He has that, that, that difficult thing in our, allowed that difficult thing in our, in our life for a good purpose, to work something, to, to teach us something, to show us something about ourselves, to be able to do something in our life, to correct something, to help us. And so we need to remain under instead of running away. We need to remain under now. You know, many fathers run away. And uh, if the little pressure gets, you know, too high at the home or whatever, they're out of it. And they run away and go to the bar or whatever. You know, I don't know. I've never done that. So, but, uh, you know, I understand there are people who just don't like the pressure. They don't want the pressure at home. They can't take it. They just get out. I want to get out, get out, get out. No, we're not supposed to get out. We're supposed to be, remain. We're supposed to be willing to work through the pressure, you know, to help the situation, to diffuse the pressure, yes, but to work under pressure to accomplish what God would have to do. And that's what being patient is, to be willing to remain under the pressure, under the hardship, so that we can be used to create good uh, in other people's lives. Okay? I know you've heard the illustration of a diamond. You know what a diamond is? just a lump of coal under high pressure. You know, um, And then it comes out to be a diamond. But it can't become a diamond unless it's under high pressure, unless it remains there. If you alleviate the pressure off the coal, it's going to be a lump of coal. It's not going to be a diamond. Okay. All right, and then we need to be gentle. Now, this word in the Japanese is the same. And if you look up in the dictionary, uh, the Japanese word for... Um, uh, Kind, you will see gentle, but if you look up gentle, you won't see kind. Okay, so they are two different uh, different words. Um, this one is um, like um, soft, you know, gentle as in soft, or is in not hard, not uh, unmoving, unmoved, or whatever. So we need to be gentle. We need to be uh, moved. Be able to be moved. Be able to be. Uh, to be able to be um, ap uh, pathetic, uh, pathetic, not apathetic, pathetic, yeah. <laughs> Pathos, it means sympathetic, there we go, that's what I meant, sympathetic. We need to be pathetic. We need to be sympathetic okay, with other people and gentle. And then good. Um, do what is good. Desire what is right, what is good, not what is beneficial. And that's what that word means, to be beneficial, uh, to do what's beneficial for others, not what's, you know, will get us make people think good of us is what's beneficial for them. That's what counts. Okay? And again, it's like the, the word love has that idea in it already. And to be faithful. Okay? Faithfulness. To be faithful. Faithful to our wives. Faithful to our family. Faithful in our calling. Faithful to church. Faithful, faithful. We should be faithful fathers. Consistent. Uh, that, that people can count upon us. They know that if we're supposed to do something, we'll be there. If we're supposed to be somewhere, we'll be there. If we're supposed to do something, we'll do it. They can count upon us. Uh, there are some people that you can't count upon. I've known people over the years that, you know, their word means nothing. They say they'll be there. Yeah, if they want to, maybe at the time, but they, they're, you can't count upon them. So we need to be faithful. We need to be counted upon. And then meek. Okay? Meek. Meek is um, being able to be taught. Being able to be uh, taught. Being humble. Being able to take correction, uh, we need that. But we're not perfect, you know, and I know, you know, the male ego wants to be right, and if your wife tells you something, the first reaction is probably, well, you know, I'm the husband, you shut up. <laughs> you don't tell me what to do. <laughs> but we need to be humble, we need to be meek, we need to be, uh, allow God to work in our heart, be teachable. We can't be, we can't be taught if we're not gonna be humble and teachable, okay? And then finally, self-control. Self-control. Um, we are to be in control. We are, we are not to be out of control. You know, we are not to be controlled by something else is the point. Okay. Now, that self-control is really spirit control. It's uh, controlled by the Holy Spirit and not, you know, not necessarily we're in charge of our life versus the Holy Spirit's in charge of life, so it's okay because I'm self-controlled so I can control my own life, and I don't want the Holy Spirit to know. No, that's not the point. The point is the Holy Spirit controls us, but the point is we are not out of control. Okay, We are in control. The Holy Spirit controls us, and we are in control. We're not controlled by something else. Okay, Circumstances don't control us. Um, external influences don't control us. Um, you know, We don't drink things that control us. We don't 
take things, uh, pills or shots or anything that control us. We are in control of our uh, faculties. We are in control. Uh, of course, we are, the Holy Spirit controls us, but we, he controls us because we yield control of our life to him, of which we are in control. Okay? We can't yield control of our life to the Holy Spirit if we are not in control. We're drunk with wine. We, we're, you know, it says, be not drunk with wine, we're in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay? If we're drunk with wine, we're controlled by wine. Uh, we're not in control. We can't yield control of our life to the Holy Spirit because we are not in control. So we need to be in control of our life, so we yield life, control of our life to the Holy Spirit. So self-control. Now, um, the first one we said would be strong. The Bible says, uh, Final brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. We are to be strong, but we're not to be strong because... We have the strength in ourselves. We don't. We are weak. We would do wrong. We would fail if it was up to us, if we tried to do things in our own strength, in our own power. But we need God's strength, and we have God's strength. God, God gives strength to do whatever he commands to do. Okay? If he commands you to be a father and to do what you need to, be, to do as a father, your role to, to fulfill your role as a father, then he gives you the strength. He gives you the ability to do that. All right? Uh, and then Ephesians chapter uh, 5, verse 9. We're going to go through a few verses. We won't read all of them, but uh, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Now, this list that I gave you is a general list. Not every single one is on all these lists, but these are just lists of uh, virtues in the New Testament, and many of them contain the same things. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true, what sort of things are honest, what sort of things are just, if there are things that are pure, if there are things that are lovely, if there are things that are good report, if there are any virtue, any praise, think on these things. And so, good, good things. And then if Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13 says, uh, Put on, therefore, the elect of God, uh, as elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. Okay, there's that tender hearted again. That's what, that's the tender hearted. Okay, it's translated bowels of mercy here, but kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, even if any men have quarreled against any. As Christ forgave you, also do ye. Okay? And then 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 says, But thou, O man of God, and we talked about this verse yesterday, uh, flee these things, follow after righteousness, goodness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Okay? Same, same list of things. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Flee also youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith or faithfulness, charity or love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay. And the second of the three ten says, uh, "But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, or love, uh, patience." Okay, and so all these verses have these these, these uh, characteristics uh, of a Christian father in it. All these Christian characters are the fruit of the spirit. I don't know if you uh, caught on to that list, but most of that list was taken from this verse here. Uh, but the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no wrong. So, if we're going to be the fathers that we need to be, then we must be spirit controlled people. We must have the, that must be the fruit of the spirit. It must be the fruit that the spirit produces in our life. We can fake joy, you know, but we can fake, you know, fake blood. We can fake everything. But if it's going to be real, it has to be produced by the spirit. The Holy, the, the the those things I mentioned: love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, kindness, all those kind of things. Those are all fruit of the Spirit. Those are the things that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. He produces those as we do something. What do we do? Uh, this verse says in Second Corinthians chapter six, verse six and seven says, um, "By pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by loving love unfeigned." by the word of truth, by the power of God, and the armor of righteousness uh, on the right hand and on the left. And so we must be empowered by the Holy Spirit to have those things. And as we read God's words, it's by the word of truth. So these are fruits which the Holy Spirit produces in us as we abide in his word. Um, now we have a few minutes. We'll go ahead and read this. Uh, John chapter 15, uh, verse 1 through 8 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. And every branch in me that beareth not fruit is taken away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more, more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. 
Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as, as a branch, and is withered. And, a man, and, and men gather them, and uh, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now this verse 7 says, And if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Here is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. And so, as we read God's Word, God's Holy Spirit works through the Word that we read to produce in us the fruit that He wants to have in our, in our life. And so, uh, as we... If, if there's something we can do, it is, some, it is reading God's Word. It is abiding in God's Word and, then ab and, and abiding in Him. And, and the God's Word abiding in us and the Holy Spirit will produce the fruit of the Spirit. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, the famous verse says, But this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt find good success. Not I command thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Need to be to say, just made, for the Lord thy God is with thee, with the thought of where thou goest. Okay? So if we want to prosper, if we want to have the fruit of the Spirit in our life, we must be in God's Word. Uh, so if you want to display the characteristics um, God desires of you as a Father, it must be produced by the Holy Spirit as you abide in His Word. There is no other way. That is the only way to produce the true fruit of the Spirit. And so I hope, as fathers, that you will realize the importance of staying in God's Word. You will realize the importance of bearing spiritual fruit, the fruit of the Spirit in your life. It affects not only you, it affects your family. And so we have been given the privilege to influence the next generation. And so let's determine that you know, maybe you're, you haven't been a good father, or maybe you haven't been the best father. But you can start today. If the way that you be be a good father is to be the way you become a good father. The way you are a good father should become the way you become a good father. To read God's word, to yield your life to the Holy Spirit, and allow the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit in your life, will be what God wants you to be. Let's close in prayer.